Hey, book lovers. My name is M, and I want to talk about books and cats. It is 2021, book lovers. I love the beginning of a new year. It feels so hopeful and full of possibilities. I love making plans for the coming year and uh, and planning out what I hope to achieve. I know it's not all going to happen, but uh, I like to dream big. And usually I get some of it done. So I've set some book goals for this year. Um, last year I set a goal that just did not happen. Um, but I also wasn't really focused on how much I was reading last year. So uh, this year, I want to read a minimum of a book a week. Obviously, I need to uh, keep that up for the podcast. And um, I also want to focus, I want to continue to focus on reading not only traditionally published books, but also self-published indie authors. And I'm still going to try to read different genres other than my usual thrillers and horror. Um, I'm still going to read those too, though. <laughs> um, if your New Year's resolutions involve reading books, uh, more books, different books, just reading in general, I have a referral link for Book of the Month. Uh, if you check them out through the link, that helps me out. It is honestly one of my favorite things. I look forward to it every month. I love getting to pick the book, and then I get excited when that little blue box shows up at my door. So this is not an ad. I'm not sponsored by them, but I have a referral link. If you go to the show notes, you can find it there and uh, check it out. So speaking of book of the month, I got the book that I want to talk about today as one of my choices. Um, it is Ninth House by Lee Berdugo. I probably said your name wrong, and I'm sorry. Um, this was kind of a random pick for me. I'd read a review. Um, it was kind of interesting. I had read a review of the book that was pretty positive, and then later in the day, I got the email saying it was time to pick my book of the month book, and it just happened to be there. So I figured I would go for it. It definitely is my sort of style of book. It's not really like, it's not really an out there choice, but it's a little different than what I would usually pick. And I enjoyed this book. I have a hard time with this one because I enjoyed it, but I can't say that I had a completely positive reaction. Um, and that being said, it is 100% like my fault and not the book's fault. Um, basically, I really enjoyed the story. It's exactly my type of tale. It has dark magic and ghosts and, uh, yeah, all my favorite things. The only problem I personally had with it was the setting and the amount of time that was spent on discussing the magic of Yale. It seems like everybody who went to Yale that writes about Yale has the same, like, reverent tone, and I've never been there. I don't know. Maybe it has some sort of magic energy feeling to it. Um... And I know that it did add to the story and was necessary to some extent. I just felt like there was too much of it. Um, and at my own personal preference, they, this book also had the like pages where it's not part of the story. It's in a different font and it's like the history of some building at Yale and then like notes from the ninth house. And I can understand why they're in there. And I know that that is like a choice. But it's just not, personally, it's not one of my favorite things. But like I said, that's all just my own personal problems. Um, I really did enjoy the book. I just read too much um, Fitzgerald when I was younger and a few other writers that just pay such a like heady reference to Ivy League schools. And I don't know why that bugs me. <laughs> um. But so let's talk about the good stuff now, because it far outweighs my minimal complaints. Um, this story centers around Alex. Her hippie mom actually named her Galaxy, but she doesn't like it. Alex has had a rough life, and at the beginning of the book, she is a junkie laying beside her dead friend in the middle of a homicide scene. 
Um, quite a way to open. She is the only one that has survived, and in the hospital, a man appears by her bed and offers her a fresh start. She gets a full ride to Gale if she takes a strange position called Dante in the ninth house, Laith, the house at Yale that keeps the others' magic in check. Because as it turns out, Alex is magic. In this story, magic is very real, and Alex has some very strong powers. She also has the rare ability to be able to see ghosts, which most of the magic users cannot see. I have to say that the magic in this story is my favorite kind. It's dark and mysterious, and it's kind of a mix of the ancient and the new. I, I really love it. And as Alex is learning the ropes of her new position as well as her magical abilities, a girl from the town is killed under very mysterious circumstances, and it seems like the school might have something to do with it. All of this becomes entangled also with an unknown and powerful magic, and as you can imagine, things get real messy. Like I said, overall, I really enjoyed this book. It's exciting and entertaining, and I don't want to give anything else away. Um, there's a lot of great parts. Some of the things that I really love in this book um, that aren't spoilers is the theme of the power of names. Um, I've always thought that names are very important, and I love the idea that they contain magic and power. I also just love magic, like I said, especially the, the dark and... Uh, ritualistic kind. Um, I also like rituals, portals, demons, ghosts. I mean, this book really has it all. Um, and on top of that, like a murder mystery too. One thing I will give away that I absolutely loved, um, it doesn't have anything to do with the plot, but Alex is initially covered in tattoos and to help her fit in at Yale, her mentor, Darlington, places moths on her wrists and they absorb the ink and make the tattoos vanish. Now, I have nothing against tattoos. I have five. I love them and would never want them gone. Um, but there was just something about the imagery and the way that it was written that really struck me. Um, I loved it, and it painted a definite picture in my mind. It was a moment that definitely stuck out. So I would highly recommend Ninth House by Lee Berdugo. I really enjoyed it. And even with my minor complaints, this was an excellent book. So at this point, I am going to take a quick break. And when I come back, I actually have another book to talk about by an indie author, as well as an article about whether or not cats have emotions. So stick around for that. <coughs> Happy New Year, book lovers. Have you made your resolutions this year? If your goals for the new year involve learning a new language, you need to check out Prismatex. Prisma textbooks are a brand new way of studying a foreign language. Rather than using flashcards or apps, learners can simply pick up an ebook and start reading. Currently, Prisma textbooks are available in English as a first language, and the targeted languages include Spanish, French, Italian, German, and Portuguese. Right now, I am completely engrossed in Wuthering Heights, one of my favorite classics with German words mixed right in. Please follow the link in the show notes to help support the podcast. I really, really appreciate it. And use code Books and Cats for 30% off your order. That's all caps, books, the letter N, cats. Start learning today while enjoying your favorite classics with Prismatext. <coughs> Welcome back, book lovers. All right, we're doing a two for one in this episode. I have a second book that I want to talk about. Um, it was a busy reading week for me. I'm pretty psyched about it. So the other book I want to talk about is from an indie author named Carol James Marshall, and the book is called The Demon Dealer. So I just finished reading this, and um, this is the third book of hers that I've read. She has a trilogy called The Women in Grey, I believe, that is more kind of sci-fi. Um, it's also really good. I've read the first two books. I need to read the third one still. Uh, but I really enjoyed those, and Demon Dealer was even more my kind of book. I really like her style of writing. Her voice is very consistent throughout her work, even though even though the women of the Grey and Demon Dealer are so different, which I think really says something. I love it when an author has their own voice, and you can tell it's them, regardless of what type of book you're reading. So the Demon Dealer 
takes place in La Puerta, a special place for only certain people, the wealthiest people, and their maids. Um, everything looks perfect on the outside, but underneath the surface is the darkness of the human soul. And Ted has made it much worse. So Ted is one of our main characters. He is actually the son of a maid. He is the only one that has left La Puerta and made it back, but on the other side as a rich person. He now owns the biggest house in La Puerta. He has the most beautiful wife, and he is incredibly indulgent with his children. Um, now, he has added something that only the very wealthiest can buy. An adopted daughter that everyone knows is no child. Now, only the wealthiest can make these purchases, and no one dares to say anything about it. But there is something extra powerful about the one Ted purchased, and Valentina truly belongs to no one. Now, nothing can go well when you bring a demon into your home, and the reach of the destruction is wide. Uh, very few of the people associated with Ted's family get through unscathed. I like this book because there is no redemption for the demon she is what she is, and she never changes. She never apologizes. There is no growth, because pure evil doesn't have growth. Um, I also like that really none of the characters are good people. You're not really rooting for anybody, which makes the story, in my opinion, even more interesting. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to put a link in the show notes to... The Demon Dealer, as well as her uh, Women of the Grey trilogy, I would definitely check out Carol James Marshall's work. It's really good. And now, let's move on to whether or not cats have emotions. So I started thinking about this the other day because a while back, and this was years ago now, um, but I was having a conversation with a woman who she's much more of a dog person than a cat person, although she had both. Um one of our conversations, I said something about, I don't even know, it was something that our cat had done, and then, like, I think I said that they felt guilty or something. And she told me that cats don't actually have emotions and that I was just projecting human emotions onto them. Which, I guess I could see that argument, except that I really, I have so many experiences with my cats where I just feel like they're so in tune with how I'm feeling that I had a hard time believing that that was true. So I decided to look it up for this week's episode. There will be a link to this article that I'm going to talk about in case you want to read more of the information. Um, so this is from All About Cats, and it is called, it's an article called Do Cats Have Emotions? So they said that there's a lot more information and studies done about dogs and emotions than there are about cats, because people have always just kind of projected that cats are uncaring, selfish creatures. But they have found that cats understand emotions in their own way. It is definitely not the same as a dog, but I think we can agree that dogs and cats have very different basic personalities. So for the sake of the study that they're discussing, they, they defined emotional intelligence as the self-awareness of emotions, managing emotions wisely, and having the ability to understand others' emotions better. Some researchers consider that cats are well aware of their own emotions, some consider that cats are not clear about their emotions, but are able to recognize human emotions, which act as a precursor for a change in body language in the cats. Um, so this article was not super helpful. It basically said that the there hasn't been enough studies done where they can definitively say how and how much cats are aware of emotions. I'm just going to kind of go with my own anecdotal evidence, um, and that's that cats, like humans, have varying personalities and varying levels of emotional intelligence. Um, one of my cats is incredibly in tune to emotions, and he likes to comfort with the healing purr that I discussed last week. The other ones seem to express love, though not all the time, but it definitely seems to be there. I guess if nothing else, they enjoy being around me for some reason, and that's enough. I love my cats. So what do you think? Do you think cats have emotions? Um, do you think they're reacting to our emotions? Do you think they're just reacting to changes in our facial expressions and body posture? Or are we just projecting onto them and they don't care at all? 
I really don't think it's the last one. <laughs> um, anyway, I would love to hear from you. So um, send me an email, books.cats.pod at gmail.com. Or you can send me a message through Instagram, books.cats.pod. So now it is time for the quote of the week. So this is what Ernest Hemingway had to say about cats. A uh, quick side note, in high school, I was completely obsessed with Hemingway and tried to read all of his work. Um, I didn't quite get them all read, but pretty close. My husband and I actually went to his home in Key West for a tour when we were there um, years and years ago. It was pre-kids, but post-marriage, so it's been a while. The house was really cool. He had a writing room that was in a separate building um, that was the height of the second story of the house. So there was like a little rope bridge from the house to the writing room, and that was the only way to get in there, which is kind of my dream writing space, except for that I'm scared of heights. So it'd be hard to get over there. <laughs> Hemingway also loved cats, and his cats were given the house, and it now is the home of generations of his cat's legacy, um, which means... There are lots of fluffy cats with lots of toes running around. I think there was 60 plus cats when we were there. Um, and lots of them had lots of extra toes. It was amazing. I found it really amusing because we were with a group of very uptight people. Um, they put on a much more, um, scholarly air than my husband and I. Um, and they seemed kind of horrified that we were playing with the cats. My absolute favorite moment was when we were on the tour and we were in one of the bedrooms listening to this long lecture, something to do with the furniture, which was all roped off and you couldn't touch it. And this big, fluffy orange cat jumps up on the bed and just starts cleaning itself. And Andy and I almost died. We had to really hold back the laughs. And I think Hemingway would have enjoyed that moment. He definitely appreciated the humor of cats. And I don't know, it definitely made me laugh. It's a great memory. <laughs> so here is his quote about cats. A cat has absolute emotional honesty. Human beings, for one reason or another, may hide their feelings, but a cat does not. So I guess we know where Hemingway stands on the issue of whether or not cats have emotions. And that is it for this week's episode of M's Books and Cats podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. I am so excited to keep bringing you uh, more book reviews and random cat facts uh, in 2021. We've got a whole new year. I'm so excited. Um, as I said last week, I have started my writing challenge where I am trying to write a chapter a week of a book. And I am going to read it on the podcast every week. So if you hang around after the music's done, you can hear chapter two of Heart of the Storm. And if you miss chapter one, go back to the end of episode 17. Again, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, keep reading. Heart of the Storm. All right, quick recap. Last week, we met our main character, Harper, who is working out at the gym with her friend, Kevo, when she encounters the vision of her ex-friend turned enemy, Mina. And now here is chapter two of Heart of the Storm. Harper stormed out of the gym with Kevo hurrying after her. She didn't think about where she was going. She didn't see her surroundings. Her vision was a narrow tunnel of black, she was only vaguely aware of Kevo trotting along behind her. His presence made her angry. She wanted him gone. She spun around suddenly, and Kevo stumbled to avoid running into her. She threw a quick punch at him, but Kevo was always quicker. He blocked the blow and captured her wrists in his hands. He pulled her into a tight embrace and held her until she gave up fighting him and relaxed into the hug. Kevo loosened his grip, and Harper gently pushed him away. Don't do that again. Her voice was harder than she wanted, but it did the trick. Kevo's face flushed, and he nodded sheepishly. You're right. Sorry. Harper shook her head. It's fine. 
She looked around, taking in her surroundings, and was surprised at how far she'd gone. They stood near the crest of a steep road leading out of the city. The gym lay far below, its bright purple neon sign visible in the distance. Where are you going? Harper looked up. The sky was heavy with dark gray clouds. A storm was brewing. They came and went swiftly in the valley, but they were severe while they remained. They stood in front of a low concrete building, tagged with years of faded graffiti. Rusted metal grates covered the small, filthy windows. Harper put her hands on her hips. The first fat raindrops began to fall. She sighed. In here for now, she said. She pulled open the battered metal door. The glass was dirty and obscured by faded advertisements for various beers. A string of dented bells jangled discordantly when the door opened, announcing their arrival. The overhead lights were bright, and the room was surprisingly white and clean. The shelves were mostly empty. An occasional can sat alone on a shelf, so coated in dust that the labels were illegible. Harper heard Kevo gasp behind her. What is this place? He whispered. There was a hushed reverence in his voice. She turned to find him staring up at a high shelf. The object that held his attention looked like a dusty box of mac and cheese. Harper wrinkled her nose. Kevo, what are you looking at? He didn't answer her. His eyes remained on the faded blue and yellow box. She snapped her fingers in front of his face, but he didn't flinch or acknowledge her. Hey, she said. Kevo, are you in there? A raspy laugh made her turn quickly, and she found herself staring at a short, wide-hipped woman with a long braid of silver hair. She wore faded overalls and a black long-sleeved shirt. She stood with her hands jammed into her pockets and leaned back as she inspected her visitors. Her wide smile was yellowed with age, and when she laughed, large silver hoops swung from her ears, catching the light and sending a strange ripple through the room. Everything around Harper shimmered, like a reflection on a pond that's been disturbed by a single pebble. Well? The woman's raspy voice was full of suppressed mirth. It made Harper's skin prickle. What do you need from me, Harper? Harper stepped back at the sound of her name. How do you know? The woman waved her hand impatiently. I know it, that's all. I know a lot of things. Like I know how little time you have left. She put her hands on her hips impatiently. So stop wasting it and ask for what you need. Kevo remained still, his eyes locked on the dusty box of mac and cheese. Harper cast a helpless glance at him. The woman unsettled her, but Kevo would be no help. I need help, she whispered. The woman nodded enthusiastically. That you do, she agreed. Look around and take whatever catches your eye. She opened her arms wide and spun in a slow circle. The air around her shimmered and the world began to change. The room was transformed. The dusty shelves were clean, shiny steel. Parcels of varying sizes filled the shelves, all wrapped in brown paper and labeled in silver ink. Only Kevo's prize remained the same. The woman laughed, and the raspy cackle pierced the heavy silence of the store. Your friend has made his choice. Take what you need and be quick about it. The woman turned abruptly, her silver hoops swinging and glittering in the light, which appeared more golden now and the flickering had ceased. The woman placed a hand on Kevo's back, and Harper wanted to scream at her. She bit her lip and held back. She watched the woman lead Kevo to the register, an ancient golden machine that jangled and chimed as she rang up the dusty box of mac and cheese and handed it to Kevo. He grinned and held it up for Harper to see. She nodded and tried to smile. The woman was watching her with a bemused smile on her face. She motioned for Harper to get moving. "'I don't have any money!' Harper called out to her. Her voice was too loud in the small shop. Kevo slowly lowered his prize with a disappointed expression, but the woman smiled. That is not something you need, Harper. Now get moving. Everything here is on the house. Kevo's smile returned. Harper felt a momentary sense of relief. She turned to the first shelf and examined the identical packages. They were labeled Healing in swirling silver letters. A cool sense of well-being flooded through Harper as she laid her hand on the package and hefted it up. The small box was surprisingly heavy. She placed it carefully back on the shelf. The next shelf held two different size packages, both larger than the small heavy ones. The larger of the two was rounded at the top and flat on the bottom. It bore the word, Grim. The other was long and rectangular. It was labeled, Grin. 
They were lighter than the small ones, but Harper didn't like the feel of them. Grim felt damp and uncomfortable, like a cold, wet blanket had been thrown over her. Grin was worse. Harper snatched her hand back immediately. It felt like she was consumed by fire from the inside. Harper moved through the aisles, but the packages were all the same. Finally, she spied something behind a row of grins. A bright, glittery ball of purple light was nestled among the wretched brown packages, and Harper held her breath as she plunged her arm into them to retrieve it. As her fingers clasped the glittery ball, the world changed again. The dusty, empty shelves returned. The brown packages were gone. The woman stood behind her somewhat beaten-up black cash register with her mouth slightly agape. She swallowed hard and tried to smile when she saw Harper looking at her. But there was fear in her eyes. That's an interesting choice. Her raspy voice shook a little, and her earrings betrayed the tremble of her body. Are you sure you want that one? Harper opened her hand and stared at the object resting on her palm. It was a shimmery purple bag. The drawstring was pulled tight and knotted several times. The word, flight, was embossed across the soft velvet in big, golden letters. Energy thrummed from the bag and through Harper's fingers. Her whole body tingled with it. She felt strong and powerful. For the first time, she felt like she might actually be capable of what she needed to do. She closed her hand around the bag and felt another surge of energy. She liked the way it tingled to the tips of her toes. An unexpected smile broke across her face, and she saw the shocked expression on Kevo's face. They had known each other a long time, and he had never seen her smile. Not a big, bright smile like this. Harper felt a flush of self-consciousness, but it passed quickly. She approached the register with her hand extended in front of her. She smiled at the woman. Yep, this is exactly what I need, she said. The woman nodded. Her hoops swung. She pressed her lips together and forced a smile as she punched some buttons on her register. If you say so, she sighed. Just remember, you can always find me when you're in need. She winked at Harper and waved her hand. A trail of shimmering light was left in its wake, and it grew brighter and brighter until it burst into a blinding shower of stars. Harper clasped her treasure to her chest and squeezed her eyes shut against the glare. The wind rushed around her and tugged at her hair and clothes. It tugged especially hard on the precious purple bag in Harper's hands, and she clutched it even tighter. When the wind died down, she opened her eyes and found herself back on the street. The shop was still there, but the sign said closed, and the building was dark. Harper blinked her eyes a few times. What was that? said a dazed voice behind her. Harper whirled around and found Kevo clutching his temple with one hand, and his box of old mac and cheese in the other. He grimaced and shaded his eyes from the already overcast daylight. Harper, my head hurts. He whimpered a little and collapsed to the broken sidewalk. She knelt beside him and held his head in her hands. The little bag was looped around one thumb and rested lightly against his cheek. A trickle of blood oozed from his temple at an alarming rate. Harper wasn't sure what to do. She knew the repercussions of her next actions would be extreme, but she didn't see another option. She closed her eyes and whispered a few words. As she opened her eyes, Kevo's opened as well. Harper smiled, another rare, real smile, and kissed the center of Kevo's forehead. A rush of energy flowed from her lips and filled him, rejuvenating his body and restoring whatever their trip to the strange woman's store had cost him. That woman had not wanted money, but everything had a price. Harper now had to wonder just how much she would have to pay. And that is the end of Chapter 2, book lovers. I hope you're enjoying Heart of the Storm. Um, I would love feedback. I'd love to hear from you about anything. Send me a message. Send me an email. And until next time, keep reading.